Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Lee Kuan Yew School of uh, Public Policy. Uh, we're very privileged and very pleased today to have with us Professor John Waterbury. Uh, Professor John Waterbury is Professor Emeritus at the uh, Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University and also uh, at the American uh, University in Beirut. Um, before Professor Waterbury uh, was the 14th president of the American University of Beirut, um, between 1998 and uh, 2008. And before that, uh, before AUB, he was uh, for 20 years a uh, professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton University as well. Um, as we all know, uh, Professor Waterbury is a world renowned expert on the Middle East and particularly on the hydropolitics of the Nile Basin, which he has written several books on including the hydropolitics of the Nile Valley and uh, the Nile Basin, national determinants of collective action. So Professor Waterbury uh, is a well-known expert on uh, collective action as well. So it's our great privilege today uh, that we have him as a distinguished speaker for our Hong Siu Chin speaker series. Um, and um, Professor Waterbury will speak for uh, a half an hour or so. And then we will have a... Uh, Q&A session, um, uh, but um, without further ado, uh, let's invite, uh, give a very warm welcome to Professor Waterbury to give his speech. Um, I'm going to talk in the general area of collective action and collective action problems. I will be talking at a fairly high level uh, of abstraction, and I also will assume uh, that most of you I have some familiarity with the, the basic concept of collective action and the obstacles to it. Uh, if, if I confuse you, which I surely will at some point, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to the best I can to answer any questions that come up when we get to questions and answers. So I'm, I'm sorry if I go over some concepts that may not be familiar to you. Um, they're really pretty simple and, and not too difficult to explain. So uh, let me begin uh, just with a, a, a small anecdote uh, to say how pleased I am to be in Singapore. It's my first visit here, and uh, in many ways it shouldn't have been my first visit. Uh, in 1997, uh, shortly before I accepted the position as president of the American University of Beirut, I was awarded a research grant uh, to come basically to Singapore, probably Bangkok, and spend a year studying the Mekong Basin and uh, collective action problems in the Mekong. And uh, I, I still, I don't entirely regret having passed up that opportunity because uh, my 10 years in Beirut were fantastic. Uh, but I often wonder uh, what my life would have been like had I not gone to Beirut and had come here. Uh, so I'm still, uh, I'm still trying to fill in the gaps of my knowledge on the Mekong. So let me plunge in here. Uh, it is commonly recognized that rational actor models are unreliable in predicting observed behavior in many collective action problems. In particular, free riding, and I hope you're familiar with that concept, does not prove to be the collective action killer that logic would suggest. I divide collective action problems into three action areas, which are up in the slide here. Commitment, compliance, or defection. Now these are dependent variables, the results of cost-benefit analyses that do not fit easily into rational actor models. I use the three action areas to organize a discussion of incentives and disincentives to collective action. I guess I presumptuously cast myself as the designer or architect of an incentive system that will create a sustainable framework for collective action. So I begin with commitment. If there is no commitment, there will be no collective action. And that's pretty much self-explanatory. But note that even with formal commitment, the free rider problem may erode co collective action. 
That, however, is a problem best discussed under compliance or defection, where we will eventually move. Mark Lickbach, in 1996, suggested four organizing principles for both commitment and compliance. The first is community. It suggests that membership in a community and the fear of exclusion from that community may be sufficient to bring about a range of collective undertakings. The calculus is that in order to demonstrate loyalty to the group, individuals will commit to common projects. Now, what might those communities be? Tribe, nation, church, extended family, a club, they may all exert that kind of force. The positive incentive is to be seen as upholding the group. The negative incentive is shame and the possibility of exclusion from the group. A second organizing principle is hierarchy. This refers to hegemonic solutions in which commitment is imposed by the most powerful member of the collectivity. Commitment here is not truly voluntary. The implicit or explicit threat of sanctions is a more powerful incentive to commitment than good standing in the group. Markets constitute a third organizing principle much more susceptible to a rational calculation of the balance of costs and benefits. If the balance is not positive for all parties to the transaction, commitment will not take place. Lichtbach offers contract as a fourth organizing principle, but in my view, it logically does not fit well. A contract, such as a treaty or convention, is a solution to a collective action problem. It may often arise in a market context. The organizing principles are not mutually exclusive. Market or hierarchy may be combined with community. Contracts may be written within a communal or hierarchical framework. The ultimate hegemon in some situations is God. Communities may produce social capital that fosters voluntary compliance. Sectarian or ethnic communities are apt examples. With respect to water, river basin organizations seldom form communities, but they often have hegemonic members. By contrast, water users associations may function within a communal context. Initial commitment comes about, therefore, as the result of loyalty to a group, arm twisting by a hegemon, or a positive benefit cost analysis. All three factors may be in play at the same time. They are dynamic. They change over time, and so too the balance among them. This merely underscores the difficulty of designing an effective incentive system for collective action. The standard models of collective action assume that players understand the agendas and motivations of the other players, and that the costs and benefits of collective action are clear. Both assumptions are seldom met in the real world. It is very difficult to know how other actors will play their cards. After Ethiopia launched the Grand Renaissance Dam project in 2011, Egypt, under President Morsi, reacted with threats of war and subversion. Two years later, President el-Sisi reacted with conciliation and accommodation. It would be very difficult for the Ethiopians to predict or even understand the two different reactions over a short period of time. If costs and benefits could be confined to the issue area of collective action, that would help in fostering commitment. However, benefits <coughs> generally will accrue only in the more or less distant future while some costs may be immediate. More important is that it is nearly always impossible to confine the cost-benefit analysis to the issue area of collective action. The parties to a potential agreement interact in multiple domains and at multiple levels. Costs may accrue in one domain while benefits accrue in another. Russia adhered to the Kyoto Convention in exchange for support in its bid to join the, the World Trade Organization. By the same token, the payoff schedule within the parameters of a specific collective action domain may tell us little about the likelihood of collective action actually taking place. Years ago, Peter Rogers drew up a compelling formal analysis of the net gains to India, Nepal, and Bangladesh 
in the, in the event of coordinated use of the Ganges Brahmaputra. None of the three riparians has been moved to seek a trilateral accord. The priorities of a player may lie in a domain not relevant or not related to the collective action. For example, trans-border control of drug traffic or terrorism may trump concern for transboundary water management. Even though Turkey for three decades has been undertaking water development projects on the Tigris and Euphrates that could cause significant harm to downstream Syria and Iraq, the latter two countries, even in more stable times, took no coordinated action to check Turkey's plans. Turkey is both a hegemon and a powerful market force with the ability to affect Syria, Syria's and Iraq's security and economic well-being. The price exacted by Turkey is to let it have its way with the two rivers at the cost of collective management. I have outlined above what we may call bad ignorance, not knowing the agenda of other players, not understanding the benefits that collective action may bring, improperly weighting one's own priorities. But in an important sense, there is good ignorance. If there is much, certain, if there is much uncertainty about outcomes and relative costs and benefits accruing to different players, we have a context conducive to fair rules governing collective action. Uh, I, bear, I borrow this concept a bit from John Rawls. The uncertainties of climate change are a good example. I have outlined above what we may call, I'm sorry, what we may call bad ignorance, not knowing the agendas of other players. Sorry, I've already gone over that. What I call inconsistent incentives may play a positive role in the commitment phase and beyond. In terms of river basins, if one, one's country is an upstream actor in one basin and a downstream actor in another, such as the U.S. on the Colorado or vis-a-vis uh, -vis Mexico or in the Columbia Basin vis-a-vis -vis Canada, then that country may be more attuned to conventions that seek to combine norms of appreciable harm with equitable use. To summarize, the commitment phase often offers up a puzzle of non-action. Rational action presumes we can estimate gains and losses reasonably accurately. In practice, that proves to be difficult. First, benefits may accrue only in the future while costs are immediate. Politicians do not like that kind of timing. Second, benefits may not accrue in the collective action domain itself, but rather in some other domain shared by the parties. That combination may mean that incomplete knowledge and indifference to future payoffs may stand in the way of meaningful commitment. If so, collective action is stillborn. Let me turn to compliance. Compliance yields a different kind of puzzle. Why, after formal or informal commitment, is compliance as common as it is? One would expect players to sign up for collective action, but then avoid the costs by free riding. That happens, but it is not the dominant response. The dominant response is to comply. Community hierarchy and market all have a role in determining this outcome. Commitment to and compliance with conventions, treaties, and contracts may confer legitimacy and standing on the committed party. A hegemon, such as the United States trying to engineer the Trans-Pacific Partnership, may try to force compliance or a party may be bribed to comply. The disconnect between areas in which benefits accrue and where collective action takes place may work in favor of compliance. I would submit that both the U.S. and Iran in their negotiations over Iran's nuclear program understand that benefits of reaching and maintaining an accord will accrue in domains ranging well beyond the nuclear program itself and involving regime legitimacy, regional security, counterterrorism, economic opportunity, and foreign investment. If the deal were one of a weapons program against economic sanctions, neither side might see enough payoff to make a deal worthwhile. Within the action area of compliance, there are a number of independent variables that affect outcomes. I will examine here only a few of them the nature of the resource, technology, and process with special attention to third-party players. 
Let me begin with the nature of the resource. This is shorthand for whatever it is that is to be collectively dealt with. It is easier for a cartel such as OPEC to manage oil markets because oil can be stored indefinitely. Similarly, the old Brazilian Colombian co coffee cartel could store coffee for long periods of time. By contrast, it is far more difficult to manage a river or a fish stock because the asset is mobile. Technology. Techniques for managing a collective asset and for monitoring collective action can render the impossible possible. But technology is a two-edged sword. For example, one day it may be possible through genetically modified seed to grow coffee outside its natural zone. That will make it extremely difficult to form and maintain a coffee cartel. Brazil's soy moratorium to protect the rainforest is enforced through satellite monitoring and licensing soy traders who will purchase only from producers who are in compliance with a moratorium. Technology may enable an, an evasion of the rules of collective action as well as facilitate monitoring of compliance. Process. Compliance fosters compliance. It can become habit forming. Expertise in the co in collective action domain is built over time. Communities of practice, often on a regional or international scale, form. Professionals in these communities receive legitimation from their peers. International recognition may deepen the process. Abram and Antonia Chayas see this process on a grand scale. For them, it is integral to a new form of sovereignty. And to quote them, modern states are bound in a tightly woven fabric of international agreements, organizations, and institutions that shape their relations with each other and penetrate deeply into their internal econo economics and politics. The integrity and reliability of this system are of overriding importance for most states most of the time. Now the exceptions to their assessment are glaring enough to give one pause, but they do address the puzzle of compliance. The Kyoto Protocol on Climate Change in 1997 called on signatories to commit to emissions reductions through the protocol, but had no mechanism for sanctioning violators. Key countries, including the US, China, and India, refused to commit. Others, such as Canada, eventually defected. But most signatories complied voluntarily, and even though poor economic conditions played a big part, greenhouse gas emissions came down significantly. A key element in initiating and maintaining a process of compliance is the role of third parties. These are actors with no direct stake in the collective action domain. Rather, they have indirect stakes that are defined by their institutional mandate or by broad geopolitical objectives. Third parties may be financial actors, such as the World Bank, international actors pursuing political agendas, such as bilateral aid agencies, or non-governmental organizations concerned with human rights, the environment, or monitoring treaty and convention compliance. The levers third parties wield are money, expertise, and the ability to name and shame. In 1999, the Nile Basin Initiative was launched with the support of the UNDP and the World Bank. It followed the early initiatives of the World Meteorological Organization and the Intergovernmental Agency for Development, EGAD. All sought, to promote, all sought to promote more integrated water management among the riparian states of the Nile Basin. Ironically, the Nile Basin Initiative's Common Action Program actually came to divide the riparians with Egypt and the Sudan refusing to endorse it. But the larger point is that the, the Nile Basin Initiative is a major link in a multi-decade effort by third parties to promote collective action. The process continues, and some progress among Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia appears to have been made. The givens of any collective action domain are likely to change. 
If the agreement to act collectively does not provide for change and revision of the agreement in light of change, the agreement will likely fail. Change means that cost-benefit analyses can change dramatically. Part of the process of sustaining compliance are mechanisms to measure and accommodate change. Change may occur within the collective action domain. New technologies may make monitoring more effective or non-compliance easier. The market value of resources under management may change. Quantities of resources under management may change, for instance, because of climate change or depletion. Change may occur in domains that are distant from the collective action and involve changing priorities at the macro scale. A shift in macro strategy by one or more parties to a collective action problem may sink it or make it more viable. The point is that accounting for change and ideally anticipating it must be part of the compliance process. Okay, I'd like to turn now to defection. While defection has not been the dominant outcome in most collective action, it has nonetheless been common. Neither community, nor hierarchy, nor market has always been sufficient to bring about commitment and compliance. I will posit that when political survival and security are threatened, or are perceived to be threatened by collective action, defection may result. Violations of human rights conventions are widespread because adherence to them is seen as undermining political authority. Money also talks so that trade and goods banned by conventions goes on unofficially. Adhering to financial rules may be seen as political suicide. This kind of defection is no different than political authorities that fail to enforce their own domestic laws and regulations. Collective action is generally accompanied by enforcement mechanisms covering monitoring and sanctions. As we saw in the case of the Brazilian soy moratorium, technical, technological change allows for effective monitoring of soy cultivation and of deforestation. In this case, violators of the moratorium would have to market their soy illegally and would have to find traders willing to operate in the black market. Moreover, they cannot hide their land from satellite surveillance. In this instance, the threat of exclusion from the legal market appears to be an effective threat that inhibits extensive defection. But finding the right level or kind of sanctions is exceedingly difficult. The Kyoto Protocol provides no sanctions and relies on voluntary, on voluntary compliance. I submit that most sanctions may not hurt enough to deter defection or hurt so much as to become counterproductive. The ultimate sanction is expulsion from the group. <coughs> expulsion may be temporary until the offending party comes back into compliance. Expulsion of any kind is, ex is an exceedingly blunt weapon. Most collective actions are designed to enhance the welfare of the collectivity. Every member must draw some positive net benefit from the action. Expelling a member will reduce the collective welfare as well as the welfare of the expelled party. It is this kind of calculus that currently informs the possibility of Greece being expelled from or exiting the Eurozone. It may be useful to distinguish between market-based and welfare-based collective action. A condominium that governs the use of a building may not hesitate to expel a member who violates rules because there are plenty of non-members willing to take her place and pay the fees and abide by the rules. The existing members would benefit or at least not suffer from the expulsion. By contrast, the European Union, or ASEAN, are communities and exist to enhance the welfare broadly defined of their members. Expulsion or suspension of membership diminishes group and individual welfare. Expulsion or even suspension of membership becomes a hollow threat. Fines may provide a middle ground, but if the defecting party is willing to defect from the collective action convention itself, it may well refuse to pay the fines unless they are trivial. Finally, as is often noted, application of sanction is, sanctions is a collective action problem itself, subject to all the difficulties above, above all free riding that face the broader collective. 
more than likely some, if not most parties, will have an incentive to defect from the sanctions. It should be clear that river basin organizations cannot afford to expel members. Unless the expulsee is of marginal significance to the organization and the community, collective welfare will be diminished. Two counterintuitive conclusions flow from this. First, voluntary compliance is probably the only way to sustain most collective action. And second, unilateral action in the absence of commitment can set the stage for collective action. The second conclusion deserves some examination. It has been suggested that sustainable voluntary compliance to collective action rules and norms must satisfy three requirements. That the rules and norms be individually rational, makes sense for me, collectively rational, makes sense for all of us, and fair. In reality, these conditions are very hard to meet. As the discussions over equitable use of transboundary resources have shown, fairness is a very subjective variable. The Helsinki rules of 1966 began a debate that today is no nearer resolution. In addition, individual rationality may yield free riding and defection at the expense of collective <coughs> rationality. There is, it seems to me, one process that, combine, that can combine all three criteria. It is what I call positive unilateralism. Begin to do at home what you would hope all your neighbors would do. Do not wait for a collective agreement, but simply begin in the area in which you have decision-making power. Your neighborhood may be strewn with garbage. Cleaning up your, your own yard may do little to make the neighborhood cleaner or prevent refuse from blowing onto your property. But you will have at least made your area somewhat more livable. As important, you will have established a practice and a benchmark that could be used in the event of formal negotiations with your neighbors. If you have demonstrated the feasibility of a best practice, none of your neighbors should be expected or allowed, all things being equal, to do less. With respect to water resources, benchmarks could be set for water use efficiency, wastewater recycling, or even water pricing schemes that would indicate what is reasonable and feasible for, feasible for other water users. These practices would help define reasonable claims based on use to water resources. Thus, individual rationality could be the bridge to collective rationality. I am not sure, however, if fairness automatically f flows from this process. Parties are likely to have different levels of material and human resources to bring to bear on the collective action problem. If we think of Israelis and the Palestinians working together to share surface and groundwater in agriculture, <coughs> we are really comparing apples and pears. Palestinians could rightly claim that Israeli best practice is simply beyond their reach. Let me wrap up and conclude. Evidence indicates that voluntary compliance to agreements and conventions is fairly common. It may work best when rules are relatively easy to meet and compliance is phased in over time. The critical element, in my view, is putting a process of compliance in motion as the process itself will sustain progress towards compliance. Expert communities, financial resources, legitimacy and standing will reinforce one another to achieve collective action. Weak commitment is better than no commitment at all and may be the stepping stone to stronger commitment. Costs and benefits of collective action accrue in domains unrelated to the collective action itself. It is hard to predict whether this fact will make collective action more or less likely. It would be impractical, impractical for those designing collective action frameworks to try to anticipate all the possible payoff schedules. The designers have to st stay focused on the collective action domain itself and hope for the best insofar as macro politics are concerned. We have seen that initial commitment can be elusive because payoffs are not clear and the interests of other players not well understood. <coughs> While awaiting clarity, players may resort to positive unilateralism as problems are pressing and limited action beats no action at all. Establishing best practice somewhere in a collective action domain 
may encourage the commitment of others. Once committed, we may reasonably expect the parties to comply out of enlightened self-interest, concern for standing and legitimacy, and occasionally out of fear of the displeasure of a hegemonic player. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>